would never have contemplated picking up a book. I just didn't want to read books. I had other things to do. But um, why? What did you think books were about? What, what was wrong with them? There was nothing in them for me. There was nothing of interest. Why would I want to read a story? Um, why would I want to do... To, to look in a book, really, there was just, it was television, computer games or playing football for me. Desperate, Tom's mother gave him books about his consuming passion, football, to kick-start his reading habit, and the plan worked. Tom moved from soccer facts to the classics. I found books that, including fiction, that I would just never have read, and one, in, one particular book was Wuthering, Wuthering Heights. For me, it was a revelation that I was reading about the kinds of places where, where I lived or went, and I was reading a story about a load of, like, sort of <laughs> quite messed up Yorkshire people and I, I loved it and I, I remember reading that was the first classic novel I ever read and I absolutely loved it and, and still doing it and that made me think that I could read novels because it was relevant to me it was about people a bit a bit like me or people a bit like people that I knew and it reading Wuthering Heights was actually a gateway to a loads more more reading. For Tom reading changed everything he started writing himself and today he's a prize-winning author of teenage fiction. Emily Bronte also believed that words could change lives. One of the most passionately expressed ideas in Wuthering Heights is that literacy liberates. Time whereof Go on. The, the memory of man runneth to the contrary. Yes, not in it. Education and reading is absolutely central to Wuthering Heights. The whole point is that Heathcliff has been brought up without being taught to read or write. He's treated as a savage, so he becomes an uncivilised savage. So his way of getting his revenge on, them, on the families that has treated him like that is to take Hareton Earnshaw, the young heir, and deprive him of an education. His saving grace is that he meets the young Cathy, the second Cathy, who teaches him how to read and she is literally releasing him from the bondage that Heathcliff has created and she is setting him free and you know that they are then going to get together and that they are then going to go on to the future and break this terrible hold that Heathcliff had had on them. Ah, go on, <laughs> Go on, rest. Come on. And Heathcliff, Emily's imagined character, took hold of Tom's mind in an altogether different way. And was there anyone in Mothering Heights that you particularly identified with? I did. I identified with Heathcliff, definitely. You don't look much of a Heathcliff That's sort good. of person. I just, I, like, I was, I mean, I was, I was about 20-ish or something like that, and there's a lot of the brooding violence and, and aggression, and I had a lot of that in me. I loved him as a character, and I, and I still do. Talking about it makes me want to read it again, just because he was so, like... He reminded me of, of a few people that I knew from, uh, from the football. <laughs> Tom had discovered the single most powerful effect of reading, the way a book opens a door into other worlds and other minds. It, there's a phrase in, in libraries, creative reading, and I think that reading is a creative act in itself, um, as, as, as writing is, because you are creating um, something while you're reading it, you're, you're bringing in your own experiences. It's hard to put it into words, but it's something to do with when you can get into the minds of other characters and see what they're experiencing. Um, it makes you better at empathising. I think uh, that sounds a bit fanciful, but I, I think it, it did make me less of a selfish person. And now I don't usually talk about books in this way, but I do believe that, in, that fiction has helped me see things from other people's points of view. The Bronte sisters no doubt sensed that reading could fire up empathy in some compelling but mysterious way. But can science explain this power? Emily's sister Charlotte seemed to think it could. She was one of millions who tried out that 19th century craze phrenology. Phrenologists measured the different bumps on the head, claiming they revealed what kind of mind lay beneath. They thought that the size of the bumps provided evidence of various human capacities, such as the ability to form friendships or to feel sympathy. In other words, how good our brains were at empathising. 
Phrenology was nonsense, of course, but it wasn't so daft of Charlotte Bronte to be interested in it because actually it was the brain science of its time. And actually the idea wasn't so daft either. Today, neuroscientists are intrigued by our ability to empathize, what Tom Palmer called getting into the minds of other characters. At Cambridge University, Simon Baron-Cohen has taken on the challenge of discovering the roots of empathy. Simon is an expert on autism, which he calls mind blindness. In other words, an inability to imagine other minds. His work on autism led to a fascination with how reading stories can produce such powerful responses. Fiction involves imaginary worlds in the sense of imaginary characters, um, not necessarily based in anything factual. And the reader, whether it's a young child or an adult, has to enter into this imaginary world. So there are various steps of imagination. Um, you have to put yourself in the mind of the author who's creating this imaginary world. But you may also have to put yourself in the minds of the characters in the text, um, treating them as real, and uh, trying to empathise with the characters. So when we think of reading as purely about literacy, there's obviously an extra dimension to it, which is empathy. Neuroscientists have identified a network of brain regions that work together to generate our social responses. Some are located in the brain's frontal lobes, but these send and receive signals from a part of the brain called the amygdala. The amygdala has sometimes been thought of as the emotion centre, partly because it's involved in the experience of emotion, when you have emotions, but also when you're trying to understand somebody else's emotion. So you see somebody else's fearful expression. In the typical individual, the amygdala shows a lot of activity uh, in response to seeing another person's fearful face. And it's not just images of emotions that produce these mirroring effects in our brains. The movements made by these dancers are controlled by a region of their brains called the motor cortex. Brain scans have shown that this part of the brain that controls actions fires up even when we're watching actions being performed. So when you watch these dancers, or observe how a climber ascends a rock face. Or how someone plays a piece of music. It's as if we are dancing or climbing or playing an instrument ourselves. Other people's actions are mirrored in our own brains. In fact, we are hardwired to experience empathy as scientific work on our close evolutionary kin has shown. The way this mirroring works was discovered really by accident. A group of researchers in Italy were trying to find out exactly what neurons would fire in a monkey's brain, a monkey like these behind me, when it did a particular action, which in this case was grabbing a banana. During a lull in the experiments, a researcher happened to reach out and grab a banana for himself. As he did so, to his surprise, the neurons which were active when the monkey had reached for the banana were seen to fire up again as the monkey saw the researcher making the same action. It turns out that in humans as well as in monkeys, there are particular brain cells that fire up not just when you do a particular action, but also when you see somebody else doing that self-same thing. So you don't have to think about how a person feels when you see them doing something because your own brain is doing it as well. What that researcher discovered by accident was empathy in action. So when we watch people doing things, we don't have to work out what they're feeling because we automatically feel it a little bit ourselves. But can mirror neurons explain the empathy we feel when we read about other people's actions? This is what a group of scientists in Cambridge set out to discover. 